today's video, I will be trying to win the Champions League with Dinamo Kyiv from Ukraine. Whilst the club have won the most Ukrainian titles ever with 16, in recent times the league has been dominated by Shakhtar. So today we take the manager's seat with the goal of reclaiming the league title and also trying to get our hands on a Champions League. Diving into the save, you can see that with this team, I have a lot of talent at my disposal. Star player for us is midfielder Mykola Shaparenko, who is supremely well-rounded, but will unfortunately miss the start of the season thanks to a hip injury. So we will be leaning heavily on our star youth prospect and striker Vadislav Vanat to lead the line and provide us with the goal output that we need, along with former West Ham man Andrei Yarmolenko on the wing. Tactic-wise, we will be rocking this 4-2-3-1 for this rebuild, and we have an amazing team to take into our first game of the season even if we do have 12 players at the club out for loans this season we will participate in four competitions but the champions league will have to wait as we're going into the conference league this time around and we have to enter in that qualification path but domestically it seems like we'll be fighting an uphill battle as Shakhtar are one to four odds on to win the league so let's get to simulating and see what happens in season number one My first priority this season was to have a strong showing domestically and we managed to win every single game in the first half of the season, including a comprehensive 3-1 victory against Shakhtar at home. After the winter break, we weren't as good at dropping four points in the 13 games, but we did naturally see us reclaim the Ukrainian league title with a total of 86 points. And that unbeaten league form was carried into the domestic cup, winning our first two matches without ever really getting out of second game. Year. And that meant that we had to take on Shakhtar in the semi-finals and they were hell-bent on making sure that we didn't complete a domestic double. Despite us opening a two-goal lead on the day, we let that slip as Shakhtar came back into the game. Extra time couldn't separate the two teams, so we went to penalties where both sides continued to score one after another until Samba Diallo saw his penalty saved by the Shakhtar goalkeeper. So whilst we didn't win our domestic cup competition, we actually did have a huge showing in the Continental Cup competition, namely the Europa Conference League. We had to qualify for the tournament, but managed to breeze through that by defeating CSKA 1948 from Bulgaria and Hajduk Split from Croatia. That meant that we were in Group C alone along with Shamrock Rovers, FC Norseland, and Maccabi Haifa. But yet again, this was pretty routine as we only dropped two points to top our group and book our place in the round of 16. Here we were handed a tie against FC Norseland, a team that we dominated in the group stage. The games were a little bit closer here, but we still managed to win both games at home and away to see us progress into the quarter-final stage. This is where we faced our toughest test so far, as we had to take on Italian side Atalanta. We had to travel for the first leg and shared the spoils with a 3-3 draw, with Gianluca Scamacca netting the equaliser in the 98th minute. However, we seemingly neutralised them in the home leg, which we are actually still playing in Poland, and finally found the breakthrough in the 116th minute. That meant that we somehow found ourselves in the Conference League semi-finals, where we would have to face French side Rennes. Again, we were on the road for the first leg, and again, it ended in a draw. We scored two goals in the first half, but yet again let the opposition back into the game with two goals in the final 20 minutes. But in the second leg, it was the French side who opened up a two-goal lead. And then the lads showed great character to rally around and bag three goals in six second half minutes to see us advance to the final with a 5-4 aggregate win. It was English opposition in our way of Conference League glory as we had to take on Aston Villa with the final being held in Greece. Unai Emery's men took the lead twice on the night, but we were able to peg them back with two goals of our own. Those goals meant that the game went into extra time, but neither side could find the winner in the 30 minutes, so we moved on to penalties with us having to face Emmy Martinez. However, our boys weren't phased about taking him on as they scored penalty after penalty, with Villa matching us all the way until Moussa Diaby missed their sixth penalty to see us crowned Europa Conference League champions. Whilst this wasn't a clean sweep of everything, it is still a remarkable season. Over the summer, we have £7.4 million to strengthen this team as we look to move back into the Champions League. But the key thing for me is keeping hold of our key players. 
This summer transfer window was an interesting one as 12 players left the club, but only half of those were on permanent deals. Key outgoings were Eric Ramirez, who joined Cluj for £2.2 .2 million. He was followed out the door by Kahim Paris, who joined Pogon, and Sergei Buletza, who joined Luzerne for both £1 million each. But we did invest in our playing squad, initially raiding Sparta Prague. We splashed the cash to bring in Martin Vitek, but I'm hoping the young centre-back will be a starter for us for the remainder of the save. So personally, I'm seeing that as a really nice £9 million investment for the next four seasons. We also picked up his teammate Vlaklav Sergic, and he was much cheaper, only costing us 53 k Next through the door was Serbian international Vladimir Lukic, who arrived from Red Star Belgrade for £5 million to bolster our options on the wing. We also added Portuguese striker Pedro Mendes to the club to provide competition for Vanna, and he cost us £2.9 million. And finally, we snagged right winger Mamond Al Aswad on a free transfer, and the Syrian international can play in a number of positions. And you all know how much I love a little bit of versatility. Those additions have taken us to the next level in terms of our starting 11, as this is how we go into the first game of the season. After last year's unbeaten league title win, we are back in the Champions League for season number two, but we do need to make sure that we actually make it to the league phase, as we have to enter in the Champions Path playoff. Domestically, we add the Super Cup to our fixture list, and we have improved in the eyes of the media, as we have closed the gap on expected winners Shakhtar. We kicked off our season with the Ukrainian Super Cup where we took on Shakhtar and in a cagey game, Vladislav Vanat was able to score the only goal of the fixture to see us win the first trophy available of the season. That win gave us a springboard into the season where we continued our winning run but that finally came to an end in December as we suffered our first league defeat as manager, losing 2-1 on the road to Shakhtar. That prompted some movement in the transfer market in January as some of that Champions League money had landed along with a few outgoings. As the window opened, Thomas Kredzora joined Elche for £3.2 million, and he was followed out by Mikel Duland, who joined Pauk for £1.3 million, and Pedro Mendes hated his stint in Ukraine so much that he returned to Italy via Parma for £3.4 million. So that gave me an extra £8 million in our transfer kitty, plus some of that Champions League money, so I had to go shopping. First through the door was club legend Viktor Sankov, who returned to the club from Girona after finding finding his opportunities limited at the Spanish club this season. He cost us £19 million in total, but when a player of his calibre becomes available, you make it happen. We then spent £17 million on Yehar Yarmuluk from Brentford to bolster our options in centre midfield. And finally, to my surprise, Sergio Reguilón was still without a club after being released by Spurs, so he joined us on a free transfer. Those signings really took us to the next level and all of them came straight into our best 11, which now looks like this. After those additions, normal service resumed in the league with us only dropping two points in the second half of the season to win the league title back to back for the first time in nine years. But we weren't done there domestically as we blasted our way through to the cup semi-finals for a second season in a row where we would have to take on Shakhtar yet again. Last season, we were on the road and lost. This year, we were at home and smashed Shakhtar 5-1 to go rolling into the final for our first time as manager. In the final, we faced our affiliate club Zoria, who offered very little despite finishing third in the league table. Yet again, we were able to score five goals, this time without reply, to complete a clean sweep of every trophy Ukraine has to offer. But earlier I mentioned that influx of Champions League money, so let's talk about that performance in that competition right now. We made light work of the qualification fixture as we faced Ludogorets from Bulgaria, which we decimated, winning the tie 11-1 on aggregate. That saw £12 million hit our bank balance as we moved into the league phase. We had some great results here, winning games against the likes of Galatasaray, Red Star, Belgrade and Celtic, and we somehow even managed to beat Man City at home 3-0. Those wins meant that we finished 12th in the league phase table and qualified for the knockout stages of the competition. Here we were handed a tough ask as we had to face Newcastle, with the first game being at St James's Park. We twice took the lead on the night, but the Magpies were able to pull the game level before Joel Linton broke our hearts, scoring his second in the 86th minute. And sadly, back home, we completely fell apart with Newcastle running out comfortable 5-1 winners on the night 
to advance with an 8-3 aggregate win. But this was an outstanding season and it actually allows me to believe that winning the Champions League could be possible within this five season time window. But when you look at our finances page, you can see the massive impact making it to the Champions League league phase has on a club like Dynamo. We now have over £60 million in the bank with a transfer budget of £34 million. So let's see who we can pick up over the summer. The transfer window moving into Season 3 was our most active so far as we have several outgoings whilst taking our team to the next level. First, let's talk about the outgoings as Ramon Mirez joined Real Valladolid for £13.5 million after just one single season with the club. Next, we saw Mahmoud Al Aswab also leave the club for Spain after just one season as he joined Cadiz for £3.8 million. We also saw Alexander Karaviv join Ghent for £2.2 million, which saw us recoup. £20.5 million pounds in total with these outgoings. And then on the incoming side of things, we splashed the Champions League cash and spent a total of £36.5 million pounds to bring in seven players. The most expensive of those was another Sparta Prague player as we signed Adam Karabec for £12 million. Pounds. Whilst clearly on a scouting mission to Prague, we also picked up Matej Jurasek from Slavia Prague for £7.5 million. Pounds. We spent another £7 million bringing in fullback Noah Mikic from Dinamo Zagreb and £2.2 million pounds on Hajduk split goalkeeper Daniel Noamov to name a few of these signings. However, it was only the goalkeeper Noamov that came into our best 11, but we now have squad depth like we've never had before. Competitions wise, we have the same four as last season with the expectation of yet another Champions League knockout appearance. However, for what it's worth, we're still not favourites to win our own domestic league, having only lost one game over the course of two seasons. Talk about disrespect. For a second season in a row, we faced Shakhtar in the Super Cup, and this year, the two teams needed to be separated via a penalty shootout after a goalless draw. Our boys continued to slot their spot kicks home, but we were matched the whole way by Shakhtar until Marlon missed their sixth penalty, giving us the opportunity to win the game, which we did to secure back-to-back -back Super Cups. Whilst the Super Cup was a little bit more tricky than last season, the same couldn't really be said for the league. We went unbeaten for the remainder of 2025, only conceding six goals in 17 matches. Unlike last season, January was much quieter, but we did strengthen by adding Ladislav Krejic to the team to bolster our defensive options. He cost us £15 million from Real Sociedad and became the fourth former Sparta Prague player at the club. The second half of the season was even better for us as we won every single game to match our points tally from season number one and secured our third league title in a row. And this season we advanced to our second Ukrainian Cup final in a row and even managed to avoid Shakhtar in the process. However, in the final we faced lower league Voskla and to say this was one-sided was a understatement. We rattled home six unanswered goals to complete our total domination of Ukraine for a second season in a row. But this year, I really wanted to see us make the Champions League round of 16 kind of as a minimum. However, we still had to qualify for the competition, but blasted our way past Swedish opposition to make our second league phase in a row. This season, we had some rough fixtures facing the likes of Man City again, along with Real Madrid, but we were able to pick up wins against Galatasaray AZ Alkmaar and HJK to finish 19th in the table. So we did move into the knockout portion of the competition, but were handed one of the hardest tasks possible as we'd have to take on Barcelona over two legs. We were at home for the first game and Barca twice took the lead in the game through Alejandro Balde and Ansu Fati, but we twice pulled level to send us to Spain all square. I knew it would be an uphill task at the Camp Nou, but we held Barca all the way through to extra time, where tiredness crept in, resulting in Vito Roque lashing home a 113th minute penalty. That pen saw us exit the competition, but I'm still supremely proud of the lads for yet another unbeaten domestic treble and a great performance in the Champions League. We just need to be a little bit more lucky with that Champions League draw. Over the summer, we have another £32 million to spend on this team, but my main focus will be holding on to all of my superstars. 
This summer was the least active that we've had in this save so far. And I actually think it's because our squad is so, so good. We did see four players leave us in this window for fees, but none of them were actual starters in my team. The most expensive of which was Vladimir Shepolev, who joined Belgian side Ghent for £8.75 million. But he only got 14 appearances for us last season in the league, so this wasn't a huge loss. We then sold our backup goalkeeper to Damach in Saudi Arabia for £6 million, a backup centre-back to Levante for £2.5 million, and a reserve team winger to Al Raid for £1.3 million. Those transfers made us just shy of £19 million in the transfer market, but we didn't really spend adding two high-potential Ukrainian new gens to the team for a total of £2.5 million. As you'd expect with a window like that, our best 11 hasn't changed, but look at all the balance of talent throughout our starters. It is absolutely superb. We have the same four competitions on the schedule this season and a fourth season in a row. The media have snubbed us as favourites for the league, but this is the closest that the odds have ever been between us and Shakhtar. However, the Champions League is where I really need to see us progress this season. As always, our season opener was the Super Cup, where for a third season in a row we secured the trophy, this time with a comfortable 3-0 win, with Viktor Sankov running the show. But this game was case in point at the, the fact that we're kind of up here, and the rest of the Ukrainian league is down here. And once again, that was super evident in the league, as for a third time in four seasons, we ended the year without a loss to secure yet another league title, this time with just 84 points. Something that you will notice is the improvement of the league standing within Europe as it has now climbed from 16th to 13th over the last four seasons. We then carried that dominance into the domestic cup competition as well as we made it to the semi-final stage where we faced Shakhtar. Despite dominating, this game was closer than the Super Cup fixture, but we still managed to secure a narrow 2-1 win. That set up a repeat of the 2025 final where we took on our affiliate Zoya. Two seasons ago, the score was 5-0, so by that standing, things were a little bit closer, but we still ran out comfortable 5-1 winners on the day to make it a 3 p of the domestic treble in Ukraine. Great. But I wanted to make it to a Champions League final and ultimately win the trophy and so far in three seasons we've not actually made it past the first knockout round so this is where I really needed to see us move forward. This season we made the qualification slightly harder than it needed to be after beating AEK on the road in Greece 4-2 only to lose the home leg 1-0 but we narrowly made it into the league phase proper. But this year we were a different animal in this competition once it got to this point as we managed to pick up three points against the likes of Lille, Manchester City, Chelsea, Wolfsburg and Genk to see us sneak into the top eight of the table and automatically qualify for the round of 16, thus making it the furthest that we've ever got in this competition in this save. Here we were handed Italian side Napoli with us facing the trip to Naples for the first leg. And this was nothing short of a disaster as the whole team effectively got stage fright on the night losing 3-1 to Napoli, with them even scoring our single goal in the form of a Leo Ostergaard own goal. Back in Kyiv, we looked more like ourselves and took the lead early through Lukic to pull us within a single goal on aggregate. But then Napoli hit back with goals from Kokchu and Kovaric-Skelia to make it 5-2 on aggregate. We did then rally with the last 10 minutes of the game to go as we scored twice to give the Italian side a nervous few final minutes, but they held on strong to see us exit the competition. Whilst this is the furthest that we've actually got in this competition, I'm still a little bit haunted by that game in Naples. We've been hoarding our Champions League money, so we have another £35 million to make things happen in our fifth and final season of this challenge. Season 5 saw a very interesting window for ourselves as only one player left the club for a fee as Vladislav Dubinchak left for Las Palmas for £10.75 million. That money coming into the club allowed me to pick up a transfer that I never thought I would see in the Ukrainian league as we signed a transfer listed Harvey Elliott from Liverpool for £25 million. He still looks exceptional in game and can play in a number of key positions for us and he's even been capped by England in this world. I also added former Benfica midfielder Paolo Bernardo to the squad, but he arrived on a free transfer. 
Elliot comes into this team in the roaming playmaker role, and I have to admit, I am so in love with this team. Albeit with fewer Ukrainians than I probably would have liked at this point. You know what the competitions page looks like by now, as we have the same four on our schedule, but we're still not favourites to win the league in the eyes of the media. Which is crazy when you remember that we've only lost one league fixture in four years. So guys, you know what I do at this stage of the video. If you are still here watching this Dynamo Kiev rebuild, don't forget to drop a like on the video down below because it really does help the algorithm and stuff like that. And also, I want you guys to let me know that you are still here by commenting the word Shevchenko down below. He's a club legend at Dynamo Kiev, an absolute world superstar coming out of Ukraine. Comment his name down below to let me know that you are still here at this point in the video. Anyway. Let's get into the results of season number five. Season five saw us finally face a different team in the Super Cup as we'd have to take on Dnepro as they were last season's league runners up. However, this was a complete car crash for them as we hammered them from the first minute to the last, running out 3-0 winners whilst having a huge 31 shots in the entire game. As always, we had the domestic league on lock as we waltzed to a fourth invincible season in five attempts to secure the league title over Shakhtar by 16 points, equaling our own league record. We also strolled into yet another Ukrainian Cup semi-final where we faced Shakhtar yet again. This was a back and forth game with Shakhtar probably edging it in terms of the match stats and twice taking the lead within 90 minutes but in that 90th minute Vladimir Lukic was able to pull us level and send us into extra time. Then in the extra 30 minutes Harvey Elliott took over scoring two goals in five minutes to propel us into the lead. Marlon Gomez then pulled a goal back in the 110th minute and Shakhtar had a golden opportunity to make it 4-4 from the penalty spot in the 115th minute, but our keeper was on hand to save the penalty and see us progress into our fourth cup final in a row. But much like every cup final we've had since getting there, it was one-way traffic as we scored five unanswered goals to complete yet another domestic treble. However, we're all here to see if I could win the Champions League and this would be my final attempt. As always, we had to qualify and made hard work of our fixtures with Louis de Goretz, but thanks to a 4-1 win at home, we were able to progress to the league phase. The fixture computer was kind to us this season as we won four of our fixtures in the league phase while suffering defeats to the likes of Man City, Juventus and Dortmund. Those results saw us finish 16th in the table, meaning we'd have a knockout playoff tie and we were drawn against Monaco from France. The first leg was on the road and we started like a house on fire, racing out to a two-goal lead before half-time. Monaco did pull a goal back just after the hour mark, but Adam Barbec completed his hat-trick in the 95th minute to give us a two-goal lead to take back to Ukraine. And it was just as well that we had that lead as Monaco really came to play here, scoring a goal in each half to send the game to extra time. But this is where playing the second leg at home really benefited us as Ladislav Prezic scored in the 117th minute to send us into the round of 16. But here is where we were handed yet another tough task at this stage as we had to take on PSG. This time we were at home in the first leg and who else but Kylian Mbappe scored the only goal of the game to give us a real uphill battle. And in France, things didn't get much better for us as PSG scored three goals in the first half and that was all she wrote. Whilst I may have failed this challenge of actually winning the Champions League with Dinamo Kiev, I really think that we've stamped our authority domestically and really given us that element of separation between ourselves and the rest of the league. If you wanted to carry on this save to see if you could win the Champions League, then you have a transfer budget of £32 million and an amazing squad to try and build on. And you can get this save right now. It is over on my Patreon for you to download and continue this journey right where I left off. And if you want to see more rebuild content from me check out this playlist popping up right here right now and hopefully you find something that you want to watch on there